This man has been freed from prison, even though he's killed children and says he'll do it again. This man is his accomplice. He's coming out in time for Christmas. This man is their leader. He'll be out by Easter. There's a time bomb just waiting to explode amongst the three of them, where they will be a grave danger to the public. Tonight on World in Action, we reveal why many police officers and doctors believe that new government proposals to deal with men like Robert Oliver will fail. We examine an until now unthinkable solution. Is it time to follow the lead being taken in other countries plagued by sex offenders and introduce chemical castration? Robert Oliver was a member of the most violent gang of paedophiles ever caught in Britain. They used to lure young boys from the West End of London to a grubby flat in Hackney, where they would drug and sexually abuse them. What the men would do, they would gather in one room, drink tea, they would sex, take part in sex activities amongst themselves while the child victim was in the bedroom. And then each member of those present would take the, the opportunity to go into the bedroom and sexually abuse a child, bugger the child or abuse a child in some way. This former child prostitute, who's now built a new life for himself, was one of those abused by Oliver and his gang. He says they used to describe the children they picked up as meat. Robert Oliver quite frequently in my company, all them years ago, um, referred to chickens, uh, young men. He would not sleep with them over 16, he said they were far too old. He is only into children. He only sleeps with children. That's, that, that's his uh, thing, you know. Um, I've never seen him with an older, older man. Dozens of boys who were picked up around Piccadilly suffered this violent sexual abuse. But it didn't end there. We came across a shallow depression in the ground with two human limbs protruding from it. What, legs or arms? Or? They were legs. Two children's bodies were found in Essex. 14-year-old Jason Swift had been missing for some time. His mother hoped against hope that neither was her son. The police come up here and then they took Stephen to identify the body. And I was dreading it. I was like, please don't let it be him. I thought, please don't let it be him. But then when he come back, when Stephen come back, it was him. I just, I just broke down, I just, just broke down. Pick a dinner here, sort of just died for a bit, you know. Um, punters and um, children alike, because the punters were keeping away because the police were after them at the time. Um, the police had went to all sorts of lengths to try and catch them and, and catch us as well, you know, to pull us in. Just to find out what happened and what we knew about that night, you know. The story the police pieced together had close to its heart Robert Oliver. It went beyond anything some of London's most hardened officers had ever seen. The men who'd killed Jason Swift had strangled him to death for pleasure during sex. There were a number of people at that uh, flat in Hackney when Jason Swift was killed, all of whom had sexual activity with Jason Swift. And although they didn't all strangle Jason Swift, they, they were certainly party to the, the strangulation because they were there and willingly took part in it. And Oliver was one such person. He was, he was there and helped to strangle Jason Swift and, and kill him. The horror of this was too much even for one of the paedophiles involved. The evidence of Leslie Bailey led to the conviction of Robert Oliver and Sidney Cook for the manslaughter of Jason Swift. A third gang member was convicted of indecent assault. Robert Oliver is the first to be released. The police officer in charge of the case has no doubt he should still be inside. Oliver was involved in other murders of other children. The evidence that we had presented to us during our investigation suggests that he was certainly involved in the murder of at least one more boy. And uh, I believe that um, although the allegations centred on the, the deaths of 20 children that he and others were involved in, 
I believe at least six children have uh, been killed by Oliver and his associates. Oliver will soon be joined on the streets by the other members of the gang. Their leader, Sidney Cook, who ran the parties where children died, will come out in April. The man who shared his cell says that Cook fantasizes about killing again. He said that if he was let out again, he'd do it again. There would be no fear of it. Because he fancies I was about getting young boys and having sex and killing them. He's a very forceful person because he did force himself upon me once, twice. Once Oliver and they meet up again, which they inevitably will, you've got the potential for a serious problem because I cannot see that once you've killed a child in the act of sexual abuse, once you start abusing children again, you're going to be content with just normal abuse. There are a number of paedophiles who are fixated on children. That is, they turn to children as an alcoholic turns to drink. They live their lives totally preoccupied with children. Um, they think about children in entirely a sexual way. They look on children as sexual prey. And therefore, whenever they see a child, the automatic response is to kind of consider ways in which they can gain access to their child. Robert Oliver may be addicted to children, but as far as the law is concerned, he served his sentence and paid his debt to society. So there was nothing to stop him from heading straight to Swindon, where he planned to work as a chef. Under the law, all he had to do was let the police know he was in town. The authorities were powerless to control his movements, no matter how likely he might be to kill another child. All the police could do was warn local people about their new neighbour. It's in response to this concern that the government has just announced the introduction of community protection orders. Under such an order, a man like Oliver would have to stay away from parks and schools and would face five years in prison if he broke it. But some police officers believe the only way to control a man like Oliver is to watch him 24 hours a day. Well, ultimately, uh, with someone uh, like Robert Oliver, the only thing that we can do is have eye contact on, on him at any one time. Um, there have been various attempts to, to tag people uh, with that electronic tags, but all that tells you is where they are, not what they're doing. Um, the, you could have systems whereby they actually report to police stations, as with uh, people who are on bail. Um, but again, that would only tell you where they are at a certain time of the day. So ultimately, the only way in which you can relatively do it is with eye contact. Uh, very clearly, if I go into prison sexually attracted to children, I don't come out any less attracted, nor do I come out with a heightened capacity to resist acting on unacceptable temptations. Therefore, it's very clear that as a means of changing behavior, incarceration alone is an abominable failure. As the authorities were powerless to act, People in Swindon made Oliver's life hell until he moved on. The police gave him a lift back to London. He headed to the East End, where he'd killed Jason Swift. The police there decided not to tell local people. It was several days before they found out. They were not pleased. Paedophile child killer Robert Oliver is back in hiding tonight, forced out of an East London hostel by parents, angry that he was living in their community. These mothers simply couldn't believe that Oliver was back at the scene of his crimes. We've all got kids, we're all concerned about our kids, and it's not fair. I think it's disgraceful that they should put a, a man like that in an area where there's five schools. Robert Oliver has rejected attempts to cure him of his craving for young boys. This is the kind of treatment he could be made to accept under a community protection order. It's called cognitive behavioural therapy. Okay, so we were talking earlier and we are saying that um there are certain situations where you might file potentially risk, risky. Um, could you talk, tell me a little bit more about those situations, what the triggers are and what might happen or how you deal with them? Well, I find all situations are, are risky. Everywhere I go is a risky situation. But th there are places like your public swimming pools, which is absolutely a no-go because of the nakedness and the change of facilities. So that is a no-go. Or like this evening, it, it's Halloween. 
uh, you've got to be very vigilant tonight, and, and people and children knock on your doors. Oh. What, what do you actually do in a situation like this? No, I don't. don't answer the door. Well, as simple as that is, just don't answer the door. The sort of treatment that we provide is generally called a cognitive behavioural approach. And, and very general terms, what you're trying to do is first and foremost get the offender to acknowledge what they've done, get them to accept responsibility for what they've done and to understand the consequences of their offences. That is often something that sex offenders cannot even begin to do when they first come into treatment. They often deny the offences, they often minimise what they've done, they often blame the victim. Therapy may be the most widely used method, but not everyone agrees it works. Its critics say many men will re-offend because their sexual urges are too powerful to control. The problem is, taking into account the psychological factors with a compulsive sexual offender may be all very interesting theoretically and may make the therapist feel very good, but it doesn't do anything very much for the sexual offending nor for the future victims. And even supporters of cognitive behavioural therapy say it would have no effect on the men involved in the Hackney gang because they are incapable of controlling their behaviour. Probably nothing is going to help. Not all sex offenders are the same. Some of it, uh, sex offenders can be treated and by treatment we're really looking at controlling, helping them to control their urges. We're not necessarily looking at a cure and I think it's important to understand that. Some sex offenders are going to respond to the sort of treatment programs that we operate much more than others. The all but untreatable Robert Oliver, who said he will offend again, left London for Hollyhead. He caught the boat to Dublin. Nobody on the ferry full of families knew he was on board. After four hours on the boat, he spent another four hours on the streets of Dublin before he was picked up by Irish police. The outraged Irish authorities took him in and put him on the boat back to England. Any time that Oliver is unsupervised and not being subject to close scrutiny by, by the police, he presents a danger. Wherever, wherever he goes, and he's unsupervised and alone and given the opportunity to abuse, I believe he'll take it. It may take him some time to develop the rapport with the victim because that sometimes happens. But certainly in the case of Jason Swift and certainly in the case of Barry Lewis, there was no rapport built up with Lewis. He was just taken off the street by force and taken to a flat, sexually abused and killed. Until a few years ago, the idea of a normal life was out of the question for this paedophile. A former cellmate of Sidney Cook's, he was up in front of a judge facing another long stretch inside. Then he stunned everyone by suggesting an extreme alternative. I said to him, I said, no amount of sentence can stop the way I feel at the moment. I said, the only way that the streets will ever be safe, and this is what Max that goes to him, the only way that the street can be safe is to put me on a course in directions where I can be controlled and I can be switched off. This is what my exact words to him, where I can switch off to what my offending is. And that's why oh, I am today. He put you on the course, and since then... He gave me the chance to live my life so I can't go out and reoffend anymore, which is fact of what's happened over these seven years. Every month, Leslie travels to see the psychiatrist in charge of his chemical castration. He receives an injection which prevents production of the hormone testosterone, which fuels sex drive. His doctor says it's a monthly treatment rather than a permanent physical castration. Sex drive is fueled with testosterone. If you can switch off the testosterone, then you switch off the sex drive and you switch off the ability to offend. It's as simple as that. Every month after his injection, Russell Reed also questions Leslie to assess his interest in children. Do you find that you're attracted to little girls still? No. You have little girlfriends, you don't? You used to, no. don't you? You used to have little girlfriends. What did you do with the little girls when you had them? Touch them, get them to touch me, lead them to sex maybe. I'm not forcing myself, but I will need 
tried to get a sex out. But what about the feeling of sexual arousal when you see someone that turns you on? Does that happen? No. It doesn't happen anymore? No, oh, I can't get it. Why is that? I don't know. I just... It's so I'm switched off. Chemical castration is based on the idea that if you remove a paedophile's sex drive, they will stop offending. Some psychiatrists disagree. They say abusers are driven mainly by the need to have power and control over their victims. For many offenders, it's an easy excuse to say, I abuse this child because I have an incredibly high sex drive, because I have no control over my behaviour. I'm driven by biological urges. Again, this, this is the case, if it is the case, in only a tiny minority of offenders. So I think one has to be careful that it's not used by offenders uh, as, an, as an excuse uh, and as an attempt to deny their responsibility for their actions. What really matters is what's in the mind of the adult, and if what's in the mind of the adult is sexual lusting, sexual feelings, that's the primary motivation that needs to be addressed. And in most cases of pedophilia, it has to do with an abnormality of sexual or even affectional orientation, not with somebody simply being on a power kick. There are 110,000 convicted pedophiles in Britain. Advocates of chemical castration say the clinching argument lies in a study awaiting publication which finds just 12% of those treated like Leslie re-offend, compared to 50% claimed for cognitive behavioural therapy. One does know from the confessions of paedophiles themselves that their victims very often run into very large numbers indeed, hundreds. And if we're talking about even a dozen or 20 paedophiles stopping offending, we are talking about hundreds or even thousands of children um, being offended against less. So in other words, a drop in the victim rate, which is very considerable indeed. Nobody knows whether Robert Oliver, who's had hundreds of victims, has re-offended since his release. After leaving Dublin, he turned up in Manchester. The police were not happy to see him in town and decided to help him on his way. They bought him a ticket to Brighton. He travelled alone. The 217 train from Manchester Piccadilly to Brighton is now leaving platform 5. Calling at Stockport, Wilmslow, Crewe, Stafford. Oliver took Hampton, a journey from Manchester to, to Brighton, which was completely unsupervised. Um, on a train where there could be young children, um, unescorted young children who would be at danger of abuse from a person like Oliver and I would be very concerned, certainly as a parent, if I was aware that Oliver was taking an unsupervised journey on a train and my child was on the train, I'd, I'd be filled with great anxiety over the possibility of abuse against my child. Tim Smith came to Brighton to rebuild his life after the death of Jason Swift. He was horrified that Oliver ended up in the town. I went to the shop to buy um, some groceries and I, 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 his face was all over the paper. So I picked up the paper and started reading it. And I was terrified to find that, uh, and horrified that he was only, only you know, a few streets away from me. Unlike other forces, Sussex police tailed Oliver from the moment he arrived in Brighton. Within two hours of arriving in the town, he teamed up with another known paedophile and was watching the law of the Wild West to apply and any kind of vigilante behaviour to actually attach to people like Robert Oliver, otherwise the rule of law actually collapses on us. Oliver was under pressure, but as the police had decided not to give him a rail ticket out of town, he was trapped. In the end, public anger grew too much for him and fearing for his life, he decided to ask the police to take him into protective custody. The church was packed well beyond overflowing by those who wanted to take part in a memorial for a little girl few of them actually knew. Inside, Joan Baez led the singing of Amazing Grace. How sweet the... Public outrage over the death of a 12-year-old girl led to a change of law in California. They went so far as to make chemical castration compulsory after a second offence. As far as we are concerned, that is really the only way to be effective, to make it compulsory. There are certain things you can do in society, and there are certain things that you don't do. In this particular case, we are saying that it's not okay to be a sexual uh, uh, predator in the state of California. It is not okay in the state of California to be a murderer. And uh, you, criminal offender, potential criminal offender, just simply must understand that. Deep in Southern California, 
doctors have been experimenting with chemical castration on a range of sexual offenders at the country's most secure psychiatric hospital. Dr. Hadley Osram is on his way to a consultation with multiple adult rapist John Carver. Doctors here say 250 people a year will be chemically treated using the female contraceptive Depro-Provera. How many times did you uh, perform a rape? Uh, I attempted rape maybe 14 or 15 times and I think that uh, I was successful maybe three or four times. I was usually really uh, stoned or drunk or something at the time. And Tell me a little bit about how well or the Depo Provera treatment has been going for you. Well, the Depo Provera has just uh, <laughs> changed a lot of things, let's put it that way. You know, I'm not focused on sexuality. I'm not uh, uh, focusing on women all the time. I don't have that major sex urge within me all the time. I can sit down and concentrate on different things where I couldn't really concentrate on things before. I have a little more hope that I'm not going to get into more trouble, so I'm more involved in things. Robert Oliver can walk out of police custody any time he wants. And even though Sussex police say they'll keep watching him, those who know him are worried about what will happen when his fellow gang members are released. The release of Robert Oliver will pale into insignificance when the release of Leonard Smith takes place possibly this month and certainly Sidney Cook's release in April of next year because they are the most evil men that, that I know. As long as people like Robert Oliver are on the streets, concerns about the threat they pose will continue. Many police officers want them locked up for good. That's not been part of the government's plans, nor has chemical castration. I feel that we should make it available to consenting individuals who want it and where physicians have evaluated it and said that it would be appropriate. To me, that's one step too far. It actually goes into the, the person, into the body. I, I do not subscribe to that view at all. I think there are better ways of dealing with it within the context of what is acceptable to normal humanity. I don't want to chemically castrate someone, for goodness sakes, but I would like to make available to them, if they're interested, a medicine that might lower their drive to the point where they can be in control of themselves and live safely in the community with the rest of us. So locking them up is a better option? Uh, yes, it is to me, yeah. Because that's, that, that is acceptable within the conventions of our rule of law. Um, I do not believe in violating a person's body. With Oliver on the streets and his two accomplices due out soon, the government is under real pressure. It's just agreed to consider locking men like Oliver up for good and today, for the first time, told World in Action that it's considering chemical treatment for prisoners. Both measures will come too late to stop Jason Swift's killers meeting up again. I fear for other kids while they're out because it will happen. You know, and then what are the government going to say then? I mean, what, what they're going to say then when he does it again? What the, what, what's their excuse going to be? When another child was found dead and, and I mean, they didn't just didn't kill my dad. So you read about the things they did to him? It was awful. That must be Brian said, barbaric. I mean, they used tools and things and it was, oh, I just can't say anymore. Sorry. <laughs>